Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Katel. Welcome to another episode of Basic Nigerian History. If you don't know by now, patreon.com forward slash Uonu Creative is where you can go to support us, join our Patreon community, become an exclusive member, all of that. So, you know, please guys, make sure you go there and check it out and help us out. Now, last episode, we spoke about, uh, what did we speak about? Ah, we spoke about Nigerian during the transatlantic slavery era. In this episode, what we're going to speak about is the British during the transatlantic slavery era. So, let's begin. By 1700, the British Empire and other European powers already had forts and settlements in West Africa. They could not take over the way they did in the Americas because the Africans were already well established and more populous, so were able to resist European expansion more easily. Plus, diseases. There was way too many diseases and they just couldn't cope with them. In 1776, there was a record by a Scottish philosopher, Adam Smith, who wrote that the African societies were better established and more populous than those of America, thus creating a formidable barrier to European expansions. In short, they had to start off as trading partners, albeit trading partners with better guns. Between 1700 and 1850 was when the slave trade was heaviest, with reports of more than 20,000 slaves being shipped per year. Much of the slave trade that occurred in the area of Lagos during this time was nominally illegal. Also, during this period, Transatlantic Slavery Voyage Database says 308 1,800 slaves were sold from Lagos across the Atlantic. Aqua Aqua, which can also be called Duke Town or Old Calabar, was also a slave trading powerhouse. A lot of slave trading happened at the city of Aqua Aqua on the port of Calabar. Mainly Igbo slaves were sold, even though the people there were ethnic. Obviously, the British did a lot during the slavery era, but just think of this as a very, very brief highlight of some of the stuff that they did. By 1740, Britain became the primary European slave trafficker in the area. However, they didn't just trade slaves, they also traded for other goods such as cotton, palm oil and so on. They traded so much cotton that between 1750 and 1790, West Africa supplied demand for 30 to 40 percent of British cotton during the Industrial Revolution. In the 1780s, it was recorded that Liverpool imported an average of 40 ton of palm oil per year. This shows that it wasn't just slaves that the British were trading. An event that stands out to me that the British did was in 1767, when the leaders of Duke Town conspired with the British traders and successfully massacred leaders of the Old Town at Calabar. So the British invited the people of Old Town onto their ships to settle a dispute with Duke Town people and then they ganged up with the Duke Town people and massacred the leaders of the Old Town people. Another action that the British carried out during the slavery era was establishing the colony called Freetown in Sierra Leone and they did this in 1787. There were independent missionary movements from Britain to bring Christianity to the Benin Kingdom as well as sponsored programs of explorations. Those who were aware of the British activity in other parts of the world knew the risk of the British expansion. Between 1783 and 1792, an average of 76,000 people were taken per year by the British. And there is a record that between 1790 and 1807, the British took between 2,000 and 3,000 slaves each year from Lagos alone. In 1794, the London-based African Association commissioned Mongo Park to search for the headwaters of the Niger and follow the river downstream. They wanted to see if they could reach the inland Africa easier through the river from the sea. They wanted to cut out the middleman basically and get their slaves straight from the source. However, Mongo Park had to turn back after losing his equipment to some Arab slave traders. So in 1805, after the end of the French Revolution which had abolished slavery, Mongo Park set off on a second expedition to follow the Niger River to the sea, sponsored by the British government. He covered approximately 1,500 kilometers, passing through western parts of what became known as the Sokoto Caliphate before drowning. Now we're going to discuss the Nigerian diaspora during the slavery. Large portions of these slaves were undoubtedly Nigerian. Yoruba and Igbos were taken in large numbers because their populations were so large. Also, there was a large influx of Aousa slaves from the wars 
that would eventually happen up north between Danfordio and the Hausa kingdoms. Nigerian slaves resisted just as much as any other African slaves, occasionally mounting rebellions on ships, but more often passive aggressively by refusing to eat or throwing themselves overboard. Actually, did you know that Igbo slaves, whether wisely or wrongly, developed a reputation for taking their own lives on the voyage. In the Brazilian province of Bahia, several slave rebellions led by the Yoruba and the Hausa Muslim slaves were reported to have occurred. In 1837, in the city of Salvador in Brazil, African Muslim slaves rose up and took control of the city streets for over three hours until they were eventually brought down by the police. Over 70 people were killed in the rebellion, and although most of the people that were killed were black slaves, the rebellion struck fear into the heart of the slave-owning class of Brazil. Over 500 Africans were sentenced to death, whipping, prisons, and deportation for the involvement in the rebellion. Local police then attempted to wipe out African cultural practices, believing it to be what made them brave enough to rebel in the first place. It was futile, however, as Hausa and Yoruba culture elements still exist in Brazil till this day. Another Nigerian, Famous for his experience of the slave system was Olado Equiano. Olado Equiano was born in 1745 in Igbo territory before being kidnapped as a child and sold into slavery. He lived both in Barbados and Virginia as a slave before being purchased by a British naval officer who renamed him Gustavus Vasa. He then served in the British Navy during the Seven Year War against France and after the war, he was sold to a plantation owner in the West Indies. There, he worked as an overseer whilst trading secretly on his own in order to save up money and buy his own freedom. In 1766, at the age of roughly 21, he was able to buy his freedom. After that, he worked as a shipper in the West Indies for the next 10 years. 10 years later, in 1776, at the age of 31, Olado Equiano moved back to London where he became involved in the slave abolitionist movement, fighting for an end to the transatlantic slave trade. He was actually involved in the scheme to resettle former slaves in Freetown in Sierra Leone, and he became a renowned public speaker and editorialist on the subject of slavery and the slave trade. In 1789, at the age of 44, Olado Equiano published an autobiography called The Interesting Life of Olado Equiano or Gustavus Vasa, the African written by himself. This book detailed the horrors and injustice of slavery, and the book was a huge success. It helped put a human face on the slave trade for many Britons and helped fuel the drive for the abolition of slave trade. In 1794, Olado Egriano retired from public life at the age of 49 to spend time raising his two daughters with his English wife and he died roughly at the age of 52 in 1797, just 10 years before the British officially abolished slavery in 1807. Now, many African slaves that settled in the Americas retained major aspects of their culture, despite efforts of slave-owning class trying to crush and eradicate such cultures. Yoruba cultures are amongst those that have been retained, particularly religion, with the Yoruba religion being mixed with other African religions and Christianity. Evidence of the Yoruba religion can be found in Haitian voodoo, the Cuban Santeria, and the Brazilian Candomblé. Yoruba rituals and language also hold significance for these purposes. Yoruba and West African foods has also influenced some foods in the Americas. Beans cake made by the people of African descent in Brazil greatly resemble the Yoruba kara. Gumbo, which is a favorite food in southern United States, can be argued to be a variation of popular West African stews, where similar ingredients such as okra, spicy peppers are served on a starchy substance, but instead of using yam or cassava, rice is used. West African language patterns has also influenced English amongst African Americans. The Yoruba language doesn't conjugate verbs, hence why they end up saying things like I be, you be. It could also be argued that cultural phenomena in Americas, such as masquerades, have Igbo and Yoruba origins. So that's it for this episode. As you can see, what have we gone over? We've gone over few highlights of the British activity during slavery. It's very, very brief, nothing major, but we focused mainly on the Nigerian diaspora. Next episode, we're going to talk about other things. Don't worry, just stay tuned be here, subscribe, and uh, you know, you see more stuff happening. Thank you very much.